Hello and welcome along to the Racing Postcast brought to you by the Racing Post, sponsored by Unibet. And so Merry Christmas. The Christmas racing period has finally begun. We've got action coming up on the 23rd on ITV. We'll be covering action from Ascot and Haydock, but we'll also be looking at some of the big races during the Christmas period. We'll look at the King George and the Welsh National, as well as the other guys' fancies over the Christmas period. Who joins me on this week's show, you may ask, we've got Tom Park, David Jennings and Unibet's Ed Nicholson. Tom, I'll start with you. How are things? It's just the best time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, I can't wait. Like It looks like an absolute crack. We've got a cracking card before Christmas, um, uh, Ascot and Haydock to get stuck into. But um, yeah, the action over over the Christmas period looks looks hellish, doesn't it? I mean, the King George is an absolute belter. Um, the the Corto Star on the same day looks a really, really good race. That's as good a novice race out of Cheltenham as we've seen for some time, I think. There's some excellent action going on over in Ireland. Um, and we've got the Welsh National as well, so absolutely tons of stuff to get into. I mean, you know what it's like, all us racing fans, it is that the Christmas is all about the racing, really. That's what really gets our, our blood pumping. So, um, yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be epic. Absolutely. And David Jennings is going to be busy over in Ireland during the Christmas period. He'll have eyes over in the UK, but mainly the eyes will be over in Ireland. Plenty of good action. We'll be discussing it at the end, DJ, but I bet you're looking forward to it. I am. I am. And it looks like the Savills chase is potentially going to be a stronger race than the King George because it's it's starting to look very much like we're going to have Gallop and the Shams, Jerry Kalam and Fast or Slow against each other in, in the Savills chase. So that's going to be uh, fascinating stuff. So Alaho adds a, a layer of intrigue, I think, to the King George, him coming over, because I know Willie Mullins has wants him to run him there for, for the last probably three years, but he finally gets there this year. So uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, Asher, sure, look, it's a great four days. Like the, Especially, like, there's so much happening on the 26th. It's hard to keep track of it all, but it's it's glorious at the same time. And, uh, look, I love Christmas Day and Christmas Eve with the kids as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a terrific week ahead, Sam, and hopefully it's profitable. Absolutely. We'll find out what the guys are all doing over the Christmas period as well with their families at the end of the show. And Ed Nicholson, what, over Christmas period, what are they up to? We've got plenty of offers everywhere, I guess. Yeah, plenty of offers, as you expect, from uh, Unibet, um, not just in horse racing, but also big sporting uh, weekend or, or Christmas period. Uh, the football, we sponsor some uh, some football teams as well. So there's plenty of uh, action that punters can get involved with on horses and uh, and the football. Yeah, absolutely. But we've got look, plenty of action to get through. We've got five races to get through on Saturday and then we've got the Christmas racing, like I said. If you are watching this after the race on Saturday, if you are watching on YouTube, you'll be able to skip ahead on the YouTube chapters at the bottom to our Christmas preview. So you can still tune in to our thoughts on the Christmas racing. Let's get cracking on then. And we start off at Ascot. We've got three races there and we start off with an absolute cracker. The 225, which is the Howden Long Walk Hurdle over three miles there. A grade one contest where all... 10 stood their ground on Thursday morning. Unibet's pricing at the time of the recording is Crambo and West Balboa currently joint favourites at 3 to 1. Champs 4 to 1. Paisley Park is 5 to 1. Dashiell Drasher is 13 to 2. Botox has 10 to 1. Blue King Daru is 14 to 1. And 25 to 1 bar those. Ed Nicholson, a lot of people are going to be liking the old timers in here, the likes of Champ, Paisley Park, and Dashiell Drasher. And I believe there is a special on the Unibet website for, for either of them to win it. Yeah, I'm glad they're going to like the old-timers because an old-timer is going to give you a, a decent offer here as well um, in this race. We're offering a super boost, which um, regular viewers of this programme will know, but uh, some might not. It's where you choose the boost that you want. So you choose whichever horse you've got the next ladder on the price market. So, for example, uh, Crambo, if he started 11 to 4, you'd get 3 to 1. Um, if Champ starts 11 to 2, you get 6 to 1. So it's up to you. We off, off, offer boosts where we decide the boost, but on this particular offer, it's you that chooses the boost. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, it's definitely worth getting involved with that on this long walk hurdle because there are some good prices in here already. And who would be your fancy, Ed? Well, I think it'll be another old timer. I mean, I, I, as, I, as I, I reckon most people love Champ. Um, and I, I'm one of those. He's such a wonderful, versatile horse. Obviously, people expect him to make uh, top grade over fences, but he's come back to hurdles, and he's proved he's proved reliable. Certainly, the first time of the season, he's proved reliable. He's got a fantastic record win fresh uh, over the last six seasons. I think it is. He's won four and come second twice on his seasonal debut. So he's a horse that I think you probably. From nowadays, coming up to the age of, that he is, he's 11 now, isn't he? I think, you know, you're going to try to get him first time. 
being a bit older, it, that becomes more difficult, I've been told by trainers, to keep them fresh first time. But um, I think that he, he could be the one here at around about five, six to one. He, I mean, don't forget, he's still very, very highly rated in this race. I think he's one five seven. Um, Dashiell Drasher is one five nine. Paisley Park is one five seven. So he's, you know, he's he's there or thereabouts. He's a he's quite a big price, I thought when I was compiling the race. I I thought he'd be I thought he'd be a little bit uh, a bit smaller in the market or lower odds in the market. Um, so Champ would do for me. Obviously Paisley Park, another old timer that had plenty of followers. What a battler he is! What a warrior he is! And Dashiell Drasher, I mean, he just he's another horse that just doesn't give in. Um, and also his record at Ascot is particularly good. I think he's won four times at the course. So it's going to be an absolute belter. Uh, and the two younger horses, Crambo and West Balboa, are trying to uh, to get on the scene, aren't they? So it is a cracking race. Uh, my, my selection would be champ. But, uh, you know, it's, it's any, any of the top four or five in the betting could, could win easily. It is a cracking race from a competitive perspective and obviously seeing these great old timers, the likes of Dasha Drasher, Paisley Park, even Koshan's in here. Um, mm-hmm. it, it really is fantastic. But DJ, just quickly, it, it doesn't really show much for the staying division at this current moment in time. It would be great to see these horses obviously run and put on an excellent display, but we're not really seeing a, a real star in the staying division so far this season, are we? No, I think it's a poor race, Sam. I think it's a really intriguing race. And uh, I think from a betting point of view, it's utterly fascinating, like, because there are so many you can make cases for past, present and potentially future. Uh, but at the moment, right now, the favourite is rated 143 and the second favourite is rated 142. That's what you're dealing with, which is absolutely bonkers for grade, grade one. The standard of staying hurdlers at the moment are absolutely awful. Um it looks to me you're looking towards you're looking towards the stairs hurdle at Cheltenham in March, and you're probably saying to yourself it does look between you know a French horse and an Irish horse, and probably these are th- what you're left with here is a, is a, a competitive Grade One in England with with you know horses who are probably on the way down and horses who are on the way up, but but might never be good enough to win a stairs hurdle. And the way I look at it is, I'm willing to take a chance that there is one big day left in Champ and. I just think with West Balboa, who I who I would prefer to Crambo, I don't think West Balboa is ever going to be 160 rated mare, 155 rated mare. I think she's she's a, a, a mare who is is talented, but I'm not sure she's a Grade One winning mare. Crambo is very much you know was the horse everybody took out, out of the handicap at, at Haydock, but he was still only finished third for all that it wasn't the greatest ride in the world, and he was still outpaced when the race did quicken, and they're going to go up. They're going to go a, a more ferocious pace here, I think. I think with Champ, the way I look at Champ, and Ed made some valid points there, I thought, fresh could be the, the key thing with Champ. Um, if you look at last season, first time out, he beat Paisley Park. He got lonely on the run-in, and he just clung on from Paisley Park at Newbury um, in the long-distance hurdle. I thought he got a terrible ride at Christmas in the rescheduled long walk last season. I thought John Joe was far too aggressive with him on that ground it was real holding ground and he like he traded at 1.36 and running he just got knackered i thought he actually shaped like the best horse in the race that race that day look nicky henderson jp manis they know this horse is not going to win a stay or turtle they i would imagine they think there's one big day in this horse first time out grade one long walk let's try and win a big one and and go out in a blaze of glory and i think this could be up could be it and, and another key thing he's had a wind operation as well so that's a, a key factor i don't think it's a good race and i think champ is a good horse and i think even at the age of 11 he might just be better than these okay champ for david jennings as well tom park are you going to be with one of these two handicappers at the top of the market with the old timers or is there something else in the field that fascinates you <laughs> Yeah, it is a really fascinating race, isn't it? I mean, that's probably the word to kind of describe it, certainly from a betting perspective. Um, Crambo, I was I was a big Crambo fan. Um, I, I really fancied him at Haydock last time. Um, he wasn't given the greatest of rides. Um, but look, he's running a handicap of 139. Um, he's been bumped up £3 for it, um, which is probably, if, you, if he was running a handicap, he's going to be one of the favourites, but... Seven to two is a bonkers price here. I mean, he's got Dashiell Drasher's running, still running right up to his mark of one hundred and fifty nine. He's got five seventeen pounds. He didn't have set. He, he might have run well at here, but he didn't have seventeen pounds in hand. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, West Balboa, yeah, likable mare. Um, I, I kind of agree with the guys. Um, I've changed my mind a million times in this race. I have. I, I think Champ is probably the most likely winner. Goes well fresh. 
Um, I can just see him coming. He's just such a strong traveller. Um, you know you're going to get a good run for your money. And um, The one that I really have got to give a shout for, and I probably will have a little play each way on, given that it's quite a big field and it's an open race, is Blue King Daru. Um, I just, if you... you if you've got Crambo there as a handicapper moving up, I mean, Blue King Daru has kind of stepped out of handicap company, ran really well over uh, Ascot over a shorter trip. I think he's going to absolutely love the step up to three miles here. Um, he was doing all his work at the end, and he just had that kind of aura of when Cobden was kind of kicking him along, he just kept finding more and more and more. And I just think that the step up to three mile would be, um, I think it's going to really suit him. He was only a four-year-old, which is just tempering my enthusiasm a little bit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to side with Champ, um, but I wouldn't put anyone off an each-way play on Blue Kinder. I think he's a really, really big price, and he's definitely interesting. Um, if he was a year older, I'd definitely fancy him a little bit more, I think. OK, a hat-trick for Champ. I'll be giving my selection towards the back end of the show because my nap runs in the long walk hurdle. Let's move on then to the 3 o'clock at Ascot, which is the Howden Silver Club handicap. Chase, this is over three miles, where Blackjack Magic is the current favourite of Unibet, 100-30. to 30. Yeah Man is 5-1. to one. Victorino is 11-2. to Jitmaker is 13-2. to Hasker Clermont is also 13-2. to Flash Galange, 15-2. to And double figures about the rest of the field in here. And... Ed Nicholson, we saw Gavin Cromwell clearing up. He's doing so well at Cheltenham this season. But he's got plenty of runners here in the three o'clock at Ascot. And there is a, another special for this one. Yeah, we have got a special on this one featuring around Gavin Cromwell. Um, plenty of offers today, actually, or on Saturday for across the televised races. Uh, this particular one I'm trying desperately to find is... Uh, if You're he... filling time very well there, Ed. Keep talking. <laughs> Go on. I know the tricks of the trade. <laughs> I've learned that over the years. Uh, he's three to one to win the trophy uh, with his runners. Um, obviously, he's got some really good contenders here, uh, but it is a very competitive race. Uh, yeah, man is currently five to one with, with Unibet and uh, Haskell Clermont is seven to one. Um, as you expect for the prize money, very competitive. So if you are a Gavin Cromwell fan, you, you, you know, you can take that three to one. Um, but I've got, I've got a feeling one of the outsiders might do well here. I, I don't know whether it's going to be his day to day, but I think there's a big race in Phlegmatic. Um, and I don't know if he could do it today. He might need better ground. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure even what his best distance is. He's one over two miles. He's one over two and a half. He's one over three. He always seems to kind of get out pace and then run on, which suggests that this two miles, seven and a half would be, would be perfect. He's run some good races in defeat. He came second off 135 and 150,000 pound handicap at Kempton. Um, I just feel if things go his way, he's a kind of horse that will pop up at a big price. I wasn't expecting 11 to one. When I did some uh, research, he was 25s. Uh, obviously, a few horses have come out, um, but I, I, I'm, just, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Phlegmatic. He has to. There's bits and bobs form that he has to pull around, and you know, with other horses in the race. But uh, if he gets the run of his race, gets a bit of luck. Uh, phlegmatic each way at around about uh, 11 to 1 would be the selection. But it, it is a, a massively open race. Okay, Phlegmatic at 11 to 1. Fred Nicholson, Tom Park, who's winning the Silver Cup? It's interesting you mentioned Phlegmatic. Um, I am hoping very that this is not his. I think there's a massive race in him too. Um, Dan Skelton, when he got beat at Kempton last last year, was absolutely distraught. It was obviously a massive plan. Um, and the two that day, I think it was our power that beat him. They pulled miles clear of the rest of them. Um, I, I, I agree. I think there is a massive race in Phlegmatic. I'm not sure it's today. I hope it isn't because I'm not siding with him. I, I'm going to side with Victorino, who I, I just thought was really impressive last time. I thought that, I couldn't believe he only got four pounds, to be honest, for the for that run. He's still unexposed, obviously not being with Venetia Williams very long. Um, having raced in France, um, for, I, he just won with so much in hand. Like, I, I can get the argument for yeah, man. He was staying on at the finish. Um, I think Victorino was just idling a little bit, and I think that Charlie Deutsch knew that he had plenty of horse under him and was just making sure that he was going to pop that fence. And he popped it while yeah, man kind of got flung into it and consequently took a tumble. Um, I don't think he'd have beaten Victorino, um, and I do think that a four pound was pretty lenient from the handicapper. I think mark of 142, given the way that he won that day, um, I think there's a little bit more scope in that. Um, Venetia Williams' form just doesn't seem to be stopping. 
Um, and yeah, I, I, I think Victorino is definitely the one to beat here. Appreciate the Black Jack magic. Is is pre- he's very progressive. Um, I just I love course and distance form around Ascot, and I thought he was impressive last time. Um, and I, I think he'll take the beating here. Okay, Victorino eleven to two for Tom Park, and yeah, Venetia Williams just banging in those Saturday winners. David Jennings, who is it for you in this race? It's ha- Hascor Clermont for me, uh, one of the Gavin Cromwell trained runners. Look, Connor Stowell Walsh is, is, a, is a steal with this claim. He claims five here, um, and I think he would have proven his claim to be invaluable, even though it wouldn't have been needed last week at Cheltenham. I think Melina Girl would have absolutely bolted up in that handicap chase. She, she fell at the third last when absolutely tanking. I have no doubt whatsoever that she would have won. Uh, I think this is a chance for Connor Stone Walsh to redeem himself. He's a really good young rider. Uh, Hascourt Clermont is one of these real typical Gavin Cromwell improvers who, you know, for so long you just don't think they're up to much. And you go through their form lines and you say to yourself, God, where did where did this fella come from? He only won a handicap hurdle at Sligo last summer, like off mark of 103. But it's just the waiting game that Gavin does. He's so patient. And and this horse has just found a new lease of life. It was well backed for a for a handicap chase at Punches Head in October. And um, you know, was banged there when getting rid of of, um, of his rider at the last. And uh, followed up at Galway, again well backed, beat the big fella off Mark 106, then went to Cheltenham uh for the November meeting. And I thought that was a, a competitive enough um, amateur rider's handicap chase. It was it was probably best known for the for the for the ban given uh, to Billy Coon and Henri to return if it flew home to finish fifth, but Hanser Clermont was up there the whole way, jumped really well, f- fought off Shambard who came out and won the Beecher the next day. That was off a mark of 117. He's only nine pound higher now. He's only a six year old. There looks like there's loads more to come from him. And as I said, that five pound claim from Connor Stone will watch as a steal. I know yeah, man is a shorter price, but of the two Gavin Cromwell one runners, I definitely prefer Hans Cork Clermont and I think he's one of the best of the day. Okay, how's it going on for DJ in the three o'clock? We move on to the final race at Ascot, which is the three thirty-five, the two-mile handicap hurdle here. It's a class one event where currently Iberico Lord tops the market eleven to four of Unibet. Altabello is five to one. Only a matter of time is five to one. Impost twice six to one. Hansard thirteen to two. Lucia is nine to one. Double figures about the rest of the field. And before we get the panel's opinions, let's find out what Unibet ambassador Nicky Henderson had to say about his free runners. Big handicap hurdle at Ascot on Saturday. You've got the Unibet Greatwood hurdle winner, Iberica Lord, back in action, but taking on stable mate Impose Trois. Well, possibly. Um, they're both in there. Impose Trois didn't run again like some of the others at, at Sandown the other day, which I would like to have run him, but it, was, it wasn't that sort of ground. Let's hope at Ascot will be. They both won at Cheltenham that weekend. Um, you know, this is a, a very big prize. And I think JP's really quite keen. You might as well have two shots at it as one. And, you know, they're both very capable horses. And Lucia comes into it as well, I expect. You know, Iberica Law got put at eight pounds to, to one, three, four in post to at 10 pounds to one, three, one. I'm not going to say to you which is the best handicap, but, you know, they, they clearly are Lucia. very progressive horses. <laughs> OK, yeah, there we are. But they're quite the weights. Obviously very progressive, aren't they? Yeah, I think they are. They're two very nice horses that are going... You know, they were the second half of last season. They were both progressing rapidly, and I'd like to think and hope that they have continued to do so. What were your thoughts on Lucia's run in, in the Unibet Greatwood? For a moment, I thought she was probably going the best of the three, or the best of our two, when there were three horses involved. She she ran a good race. Um, I don't know that it was... You know, she has got to find a bit. The weights tell you that she's probably got the uh, you know she's probably not badly handicapped on that run um when she's good she's very good and i think you can't rule her out yeah nikki with some really fascinating contenders in this race three interesting horses actually ed um would you be with one of the nikki runners or are you elsewhere I would be with a Nicky Anderson runner, but the problem is I don't know which one, um, which is handy because we're offering a special bet. Um, Nicky Anderson to win this race is six to five. He's got the first, third and sixth favourites at the moment at the time of recording. Um, and certainly two of those are typical improving 
handicap hurdlers for Nicky Henderson and JP McManus. Iberico Lord is our current favourite, the winner of the Unibet Greatwood, which is always a great race. That form has already seen its form being boosted. Uh, Sonny Gino, who f- was fourth in that race, I think, winning at Aintree next time out. Um, and it's always a deep race. Um, and he won it really well, it must be said. Um, but in that race, uh, Lucia was third and ran a cracker. I think uh, she's now eight pounds better off for seven lengths or something like that. And... Um, she ran really well coming into the home straight she was going just as i thought just as well as the uh the leader so she must have a good chance if it is better ground i don't know what the ground's going to be um but i was talking to her owner uh after cheltenham and he said a couple of interesting things one is they're adamant she needs better ground and secondly this might be her last season hurdling and they might try the flat at the end of this season and uh they're going to be going for a, a race up at nottingham that uh that some of the, the cup horses running before thinking about Royal Ascot. So, yeah, this is the last season for Lucia. And depending on how she gets on in the flat, it might be her last year altogether on the race course. But uh, Lucia, I think she got, she's got she got a flat or two win in her, definitely. Can she win this big race? I think she can. She's 10 to 1. She's a big price. Um, that would be my selection each way, given the, 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 uh, the poundage turnaround and being a bigger price than both uh, the other two, in, in, in Berica Lord and, and in Pertois, who's gone up £10 for winning that race at Cheltenham, um, but deserved to the way that he won that. So, yeah, Nicky's got a very strong hand, 6-5 to five, that he wins the race with Unibet. Might be a nice little way of covering the field. Yeah, he has three really good contenders, so 6-5 to five for him to win this race may not be the worst bet in the world. David Jennings, surely it's only a matter of time before only a matter of time puts in his best behaviour on a race course and wins a race like this, isn't it? Yeah, so, so it's very hard to know what to do with only a matter of time, like because um, uh, he's done it twice now, obviously. But there's a couple of things here. Uh, I would be shocked if Daddy Mullins set off on the inside here. Um, I think different tactics will be deployed. I think like he was hard against the, the rail at on the inside, which is the perfect place to be for most most horses in the Great Wood. But then there's no rail for a lot of the back straight, and he has that option of running out. Um, so I'd imagine Danny's instructions would be, you get smack bang in the middle of horses here as for as far and as long as you can. Look, he's one pound out of the heart, handicap, but this horse could be spectacularly well handicapped. It was far too easy to know. It was far too early to know. There was four to jump when he ran out of Cheltenham. But I think if I was having an in-play bet in that race at Cheltenham at that time before he ran out, it probably would have been him. Like, he he was tanking through the race. He was loving it. He was jumping well. Everything was going fine. Um, I'd say he's a really well-handicapped horse. I think it's it's a race that it's... Uh, you, you and um, Tom might be a bit different here. But I think it's a race where it's very hard to have a strong opinion because... I think there's no doubt a Berico Lord is well handicapped. Like he's got up eight pounds for winning the Great Wood, but he was well on top of the line in the Great Wood. He's lightly raced, he's unexposed, could be anything. Uh Altabelli could be really well handicapped as well. I thought it was a crack and run behind uh, Knickerbocker Glory um last time at Ascot back in November. And like when you go through his form and you kind of say to yourself, God, there's so much untapped potential there. Even going back to the day he beat Ginny's Destiny in a bumper at Exeter. So he could be anything. In Poissois, I thought was nicely on top of the line at Cheltenham as well the day before uh, Iberico Lord, or two days before Iberico Lord won. So he's gone up £10 for that. So he could be well handicapped. And then you, you're into the likes of Hansard and Lucia. The one thing I'll say about Lucia is, I don't know how much Lucia really wants to win. I thought there's been a couple of races really there for the take, and especially the race at Weatherby, where I thought it was there for her if she wanted it. And I'm not sure she really wants to go by. And I thought Everton went absolutely perfect for her last time at Cheltenham. And it's interesting, Ed spoke to the owners about Lucia, saying that they think she wants better ground. I always thought she wanted a bog. I think she wants deep ground. So it's interesting to hear them saying that. So uh, maybe she will improve for the better ground. Hansard obviously has a chance. I, in a nutshell, I don't know, Sam. I don't know what's going to win. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's probably... I think Oberico Lord is the most likely winner. But I think it's 6-1. to one, It's worth taking a chance in only a matter of time because I have a feeling there could be a nice few pounds up their sleeves there. And, and just expect different tactics. Expect him to be in the middle of the pack with the horses either side. So it's tended to vote for only a matter of time for me. Yeah, tentative vote for DJ, and you can see why with the way that the uh, 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 only matter of time runs. And Tom Park, please don't tell me you're going to be taking a chance on only matter of time. No, um, the fact he's done it twice, I'm happy to... I, I, I don't think that he'll do it again. Um, 
But look, he's, do you think he's handicapped to win it then, Tom? If if, if he doesn't do that again, I, I do you think, think he's going to win? I it? Think, I think the vibes are he's well handicapped. Um, I mean, if you look at some of the Paul Byrne runners that ran in the Greatwood recently, the shunter got smashed off the board, and I can't remember the name of the one that ran that it got kind of smashed up anti post as the bookies were running scared, I think, and then actually on the day it drifted right out and ran a stinker. Um, they they did back this at Cheltenham. Um, so I, I I think they do think it's well handicapped. Um, I'm happy to take a chance. I, I agree with DJ to a certain degree. It's a race that it, 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 there are a lot of potential winners here. The Great Wood, I think... <clears throat> I think it was a very good race this year. Um, Iberical Lord was on the top at the end. I'm just not sure whether that form will kind of... I think it's good form, but whether... I think the first three, four home that day might actually keep flipping positions all the way through the season. I could certainly see Lucia running well. I agree with DJ. I just I can see him coming there on the bridle two out and then just not quite getting home um i think as a each way alternative i'd probably side with her over the great wood winner um but i like alto alto belly here um i think this has been a, a big big plan um and i'm going to take a chance that look iberica lord lucia maybe their big day was at the great wood um i think harry fry has penciled this in as the race for alto belly he's given spin over course and distance last time he ran a really, really eye-catching race. He was out the back, um, went wide around swinging bottom and just made up the ground so, so quickly. Um, jumped, I think, the second last, basically in front. Then just got, he got tired, I think. He wasn't really given a hard time. I think this has been the plan for a long, long time. Um, he's won this race before Harry Fry with Jolly's cracked it. Um, he's brilliant when he's he lays one out for these kind of races. And I just think that... Um, I'm very keen. I think this is a properly good horse who is running off a very favourable mark. Um, and listen, only matter of time, he's probably going to have to have 10, 12 pound up his sleeve because I think this is what Alto Belly's got. Um, yeah, I'm expecting a big run. I, I'm very, very keen on Alto Belly. Yeah, I like Alta Belly as well. And Harry Fry, look, he's definitely in form. He unleashed a bit of a beast on Wednesday at Newbury, didn't he? In Gidley Park, who was ultra impressive there. So, yeah, Alta Belly will be the selection for myself and Tom Park. We've got Haydock still to cover shortly after this. I want betting on the horses to be anything but flat. With an app that impresses every time out. You're on. Want to watch live streaming of races in the UK, Ireland and around the globe? And get a chance to win even bigger with three uni boosts every day on any horses you want. Unibet, you're on. Welcome back to the second part of the Racing Postcast, brought to you by the Racing Post, sponsored by Unibet. We've only got a couple of races to cover from Haydup before we get stuck into the Christmas racing. We kick things off with the 130 there, which is the Tommy Whittle handicap chase, three mile, one and a half furlongs here. Unibet's betting at the time of the recording. Looks like this. Famous Bridge, top in the market, 11 to 4. Credo's 4 to 1. On Guard is 9 to 2. Eleanor Bob, 5 to 1. Bill Baxter, 8 to 1. Burroughs Diamond and Dr. Kananga, 11 to 1 and 12 to 1 and bigger about the others. Um, Ed Nicholson, kick us off with a, a winner at Haydock here. I'll first kick you off with the best offer of the day from Unibet, which is money back second or third in this race. So if you do fancy a horse in the Tommy Whittle um, and it comes second or third, uh, you will get your money back as cash. Do check the terms and conditions on the website for that offer. Um, my eye was instantly drawn to Bill Baxter. Uh, on this course, it's very similar to entry as we know. Bill Baxter won the top and off a racing of 133. He's been dropped a pound to 140 from two efforts this season. Um, you would imagine that this would be the. Uh, I mean, I know he ran in the Coral, the Coral Gold Cup, uh, finishing eighth. That that's obviously a, a race that they would have wanted to win. But this is another race that probably fits into their schedule. We know that the track. Well, I think the track will suit. Um, they've got the excellent James Bowen on board, who's another jockey who's absolutely riding everyone to sleep at the moment really good jockey as we know um and i just let when i looked at the odds on the unibet website when i when i put the research together he was nine to one he's now he's now 13 to two 
So there's been a bit of early support since we since we issued the prices on Bill, Bill Baxter. He will carry 12 stone and give everything else weight, but he's a lightly raced individual. He's, he's only had 16 runs in his life. He's won six and he's won 120 grand worth of prize money, most of that coming from the, the top. Of him. But um, I, I think he's still got another big race in him and he's certainly a horse that I like. And I just thought the way this race might run um, and the style of, of, of his racing suggest to me that this particular Tommy Whittle is just up up his street and uh, that would be my selection Bill Baxter okay Bill Baxter at eight to one in the Tommy Whittle Fred Nicholson Tom Park we've got the excellent insurance there or second and third money back as cash with Unibet but I don't want second or third I want you to give me the winner honestly like it I've been smiling throughout that it's as if Ed's reading my notes from my <laughs> screen um <laughs> like I, I, I can only just really emulate what he said I think that Big fan of horses running at Haydock who who run at Aintree and vice versa. I think they're very similar tracks. They have similar demands. I think he'll love it round here, and it is a massive horses for courses track. So if he does take to it like he took to Aintree, um, he, he, he'll beat these no problem. Um, I think he's he, still at 32. I think he's the class of the field. I know he's got top weight, which suggests he is. Um, what I, I, The Coral Gold Cup, I think it was a really good race this year, but I think it was a peculiar race and it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of the beaten horses who were beaten quite a long way because there was a lot of them because they were really well strung out um, come out and, and win this season. I think Bill Bax is definitely worth forgiving that run. Um, it wasn't a bad run. If you look at him beating 21 lengths, you'd think it was a bad run. It wasn't a bad run at all. Um, if you take the first two out of the race, then he's only beaten 10 and a half lengths. It, starts to, it, it was just a... It was a funny race, um, and I'm happy to forgive it. There'll be one later that I'm going to forgive from who ran in the race as well. Um, so I'm happy to forgive that. Um, Topham was excellent. like, um, And you don't win a Topham. I know he was rated 133 at the time. You don't win a Topham unless you're good. Um, and I think he's a better horse than 140. Definitely think he's a better horse than 140. I think they'll be working back from the Grand National. He's definitely going to need to win. Um to get into the Grand National this year, maybe win a couple. And I think they'll be all out to win this because I think it's there for the taking. I'm not sure it's as strong a race as... Certainly don't think the betting is is, is how it should suggest. I, I think Bill Bass has got a good chance here. And um, yeah, even at the well back 13-2, I'm more than happy to take that, I think. Okay, two votes for Bill Baxter. Unibet's still currently 8-1, to one, so it's a, a good price here. And David Jennings, go on, make it a hat-trick for Bill Baxter. No, I'm going to be a boring one here. Um, I thought Famous Bridge was... Uh, I actually thought 11-4 to 4 was too big about Famous Bridge. I, I I thought he got away okay with a six-pound rise for that win on, on Betfair Chase Day. He beat Credo fair and square there. I thought the whole way through the race, Sean Quinlan knew he was on the best horse in the race and he rode him like that. thought he would value for more than I thought he shaped like the best horse in the race at air the time before. And that has been his only defeat in his last four starts. I think it's a well-handicapped horse and... Uh, I think for all that I can see the upside to Bill Baxter, um, I think he'll do well to give uh, Famous Bridge five pound. To be honest with you, okay, Famous Bridge at eleven four for David Jennings. One more race from Haydock, the two hundred five. There is a handicap hurdle over two miles where Jaguar is currently topping the market at four to one. Bois Gilbert is five to one. Gubernator eleven to two. Bubble Doobie is eleven to two. The Churchill Lad also eleven to two. Riss Dargent is thirteen to two. Bingo. And word has it a nine to one and bigger about the rest in here. Ed Nicholson, anything on this race? It's a uh, it's a typically difficult race to fathom, isn't it? Plenty of winners, recent winners in the field. Um, I didn't have a strong opinion on this whatsoever. Um, the favourite is uh, twice race Jaguar, who is yet to win, but being placed twice second. Um, and there are plenty of winners opposing him. So I actually thought of the prices that Jaguar was probably worth opposing. He's now down to one hundred and thirty with us. Um, but um, I thought there were plenty. I thought this race was quite deep in its own right. It's not a particularly brilliant handicap, but it's uh, it's quite deep with horses that can win in this grade. So I was going to swerve it, but if I was going to have a bet, it would be something something like the uh, uh, Risk d'Argent trained by uh, Sir Ralph Nick Schofield uh, towards the bottom end of the handicap has uh, has has had one run already this season, um, nicely weighted. But really, it's a it's a race that I wouldn't be having a bet in myself. Um, it's a really difficult race, I thought. I'll be I'll be interested to know what the experts think. 
Absolutely, yeah. It's look, you don't have to have a bet on every race over the Chris period. There's so much racing, including 11 races on Boxing Day and the MO here at the Racing Post. And Unibet is always gamble with money. You can only afford to lose. But David Jennings, have you got a strong opinion? Yeah, well, Jaguar has entered tomorrow at Ascot, so it's going to be interesting to see whether Jaguar runs tomorrow. Uh, I'd imagine he probably will, to be honest with you, because uh, I think John Joe Neal Jr. is down to ride him tomorrow in that 2.30 at Ascot. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see if he shows up there. I, I, I actually like one in this, and uh, I think 15-2 to two is a big price about gu- Gubernator uh, for uh, Donald McCain and, and Tim Leslie. Uh, Theo Giller takes the ride. Um, I think this is now a w- really well-handicapped hurdler. Uh, he was off for Yonks. I think it was over 500 days and he came back for a flat handicap at Catterick on bottomless ground at the end of October, and Jason Hart rode him. Uh, there was actually a well-fancied horse of Sir Mark Prescott's in the race, and the two of them pulled miles here. It looked for all the world that Morgan Cole was going to go by on, on Genesis, and he didn't. Gubernator fought back off a mark of 83, like, on the flat, and there were miles clear the third that day. Um, he's gone up another couple of pounds on the flat to 85, and I just don't think we've got a chance to see the best of him yet over hurdles. Like, don't forget, he was fourth in the Cesarewitch behind Buzz a couple of years ago off a mark of 86 on the flat. If you go through his hurdle form, it's it's a bit hit and miss. But there are a couple of different pieces of form which makes me think that there is a big handicap hurdle in him. Like, the, he went off favour for a race at Doncaster in 2021 off a mark of 126. He still relatively likely raced over hurdles. Um, I think... He is well handicapped off mark of 122, and uh, he's still only seven. Uh, I like him. I like him a lot. That is Gubernator at 15 to 2 in the 205. Gubernator for David Jennings and Tom Park kick, uh, sorry, end our Saturday action with a winner. Yeah, I agree with DJ. I think um, he's re- he won a handicap of 83 on the flat. Like, that transcends to more. Uh, he should be a lot better over hurdles than 122. Um, I go back to that Doncaster race where he was beat by uh, a pretty well handicapped horse at the time called Cobbler's Dream. Um, I, that was that was a pretty good run. He went off favourite for that. I was off 126. Um, look, he's been off he'd been off for a long time, but for him to come back on the flat um, and win off a mark of 83, he's shown that he's got still retains tons of ability. Um, I'm surprised he's as big as he is. It's one that I will probably wait and see how the kind of market responds to. Him, and it'll be interesting to see where Jaguar goes, but um, yeah, like this is this is one that I probably will have a play on. Um, if there's a little bit of money for him, it will give me a little bit more confidence. Um, he obviously hasn't run over hurdles for a long, long time, um, but yeah, it, 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 he's he's definitely one that interests me the most. Anyway, there we go. A few selections there for Gubernator, um, who at eleven to two looks a fair price. Uh, Coming up now is a, a quick advert. We've got Members Club available now on the Racing Post app. You can get access to all the features there, all the race replays, all coming soon to you on the app. And here's a bit more info. Members Club is now available on the Racing Post app. All Members Club subscribers can now access premium news and tips anytime, anywhere. Plus, if you're not already a member, you'll get 50% off your first three months. If you haven't already subscribed yet and want to join the greatest club in racing, simply visit racingpost.com forward slash subscribe. Welcome back to the final part of the Racing Postcast, brought to you by the Racing Post, sponsored by Unibet. We've got Sam Hart, David Jennings, Tom Park and Ed Nixon. We were spinning you through the Saturday action, we're now spinning you through the Christmas action. We're after Christmas now, we're full of mince pies, full of Christmas dinner and we're sitting down watching the race. And the big race on the 26th is of course the King George at 2.30 from Kempton, where Unibet currently have Alaho as the 13 to 8 favourite. Brave Man's Games, 5 to 2. Shishkin, 5 to 1. Jerry Kalam is 7 to 1. The Real Wacker, 8 to 1. Royal Pagai, 9 to 1. Hewick is 16s. And Frodon is the outsider of the lot at 40 to 1. Obviously, we will be waiting for full decks, which will come on Saturday morning. However, we roughly know who or who might run and who might not. And Ed Nicholson, Alaho, 13 to 8 favourite. You were quoted that he might go off. A bit shorter than this with Unibet early in the week. Yeah, well, he was around two. Well, it was two to one with Unibet when the Racing Post um, asked asked us what, what we thought was going to happen. And I mean, it's not rocket science when you know that Jerry Colomb was possibly going to stay in Ireland, but he was around about nine to two at the time. Jerry Colomb is now, he's, you know, he's now still around about six to one, seven to one with us actually. Um, but um, more from David later on about where Jerry Colomb might go 
at Christmas time, which meant that the price of Alaho was going to shorten whatever. And there would be no support for Brave Man's game. I mean, Brave Man game, 5-2, to 11-4 to four since defeat um, uh, this season in the Betfair uh, chase. So it, 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 all the action was for Alaho. And it was interesting because it was it, the win market seemed just to be about Alaho. So that's why we suggested it might be somewhere near evens. The participation of the front runners and the fact that the support was coming and it looked like uh, Willie Mullins had decided that this was the place to come this Christmas time with Alaho. But also, we did see some each way uh, betting as well, um, with the horses maybe coming into the frame, um, with other horses disappearing off to Ireland. So, Frodon was back from 66 into 40s at the same time. Um, and Shiskin was a very interesting horse, back from sevens at the time each way. Uh, and Shiskin, I note now, is five to one with us. Uh, and his third favourite. So it's a very interesting betting market. It's always been a great race to watch, isn't it? I mean, uh, Christmas Day is good, but Boxing Day watching the King George is better for me. I, I've, we sponsored it when Mike Bite won it in, was it 2017? The 32 Red. Um, and it's always been a great race. Absolutely love it. You're too young, but I remember a horse called the Mighty Mac, Dave. Do you remember the Mighty Mac? One of the one of the greatest jumpers of a fence I've ever seen. Yeah. And watching him, he jump was around, some jumper. He was jumping around Kempton, watching it on the TV screen with my Irish uncle. Uh, the one of my favourite Christmas memories. Um, so yeah, it's a race I'll be really glued to the TV on this particular year. But to Alaho is the uh, favourite, and and he's all all the rage. I say thirteen to eight with the thumb. I think he'll. That means he'll probably you know he's been well supported at, at thirteen to eight. Yeah, I mean, DJ, Ed's mentioned there, this horse could go off shorter and may even be an even money shot on the day. We'll just wait to see whether any more sport sort of comes to the likes of Shishkin, a brave man's game. But we did find out that Jerry Colum, well, we didn't know whether he was going for the King George, whether he was going for the Savile's Chase, and we've now found out that they may end up going for what I like to call the Alboom Photo Race on New Year's <coughs> Day at Furlers. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, sure, he could, yeah. I, I don't think any decision has been made yet. Hopefully I'll find out at some stage today um, I see. I, I think a lot of it does kind of depend on ground with Jerry Kalam, and uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. At the moment, I'd imagine he, the, probably the Savage Chase is probably slight favour. I don't know. Maybe he'll go to more potentially. I don't know. But uh, this is this is interesting, isn't it? Like it's it's one of these races where. Uh, for so long, we kind of didn't really think Alaho was going. And I remember doing like Willie Wollins a stable tour early on, and that was back ages ago. Like, and the King George wasn't really at the forefront of his mind at that stage. But I do think he just wanted to get that run in the Clonmel Oil out of him. We learned absolutely nothing about Alaho in the Clonmel Oil. And um, if anything, we probably learned more negative things than positive things about him because it was a little bit lethargic at various stages of the race. And he probably didn't jump with his usual, you know, flamboyancy and fluency, but it was bottomless ground and he hadn't ran since April 2022. Look, the real Alaho wins this, but what's the chances of the real Alaho? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like horses that have missed the season. I don't like horses that are coming from one run on bottomless ground. So there are a few kind of areas where you say to yourself, you know, maybe Alaho was worth taking on here. Look, Brave Man's game, to be honest, Brave, Man, Brave Man's game has probably got more negative press than he should have got. Um, uh, like, he's a brilliant jumper. And I don't think that the, the Betfair chase was never the race for him. You know, three miles, one and a half furlongs on soft ground at Haydock. A uh, couple of weeks after the Charlie Hall, it wasn't the right race to go for. Now, whether that's taking the edge off him for this race, I don't know. But he is a fantastic jumper. And no matter where he is in the race, he's going to always keep himself in the race with his jumping. And I just think a track like Kempton really does suit his jumping. And I think you can you can actually um, up upscale his performance in the race last year. Because you have to remember, he was on the outside of Long Press the whole way. And I was scratching my head going, what on earth is Harry Cobden doing here? And I never criticised Harry Captain, but I thought it was mad to be on the wrong side of Long Press. But anyway, he won it convincingly in the end. Um, I think he's probably the most likely winner of Brave Man's game. Shishkin, Shishkin is the one just nagging away at me, just nagging, nagging away. He's still thoroughly unexposed over this trip. Like he, Ahoy Senior never really missed a beat around, uh, around AJ. Like the, the Ahoy Senior we once knew and loved, like not the Ahoy Senior we know now. And he never missed a beat. And Shishkin had a mountain to climb to get to him. And he still got to him and was nicely on top of the line at Aintree. Um, he is moody and he's 
he's one of those where you're like, you kind of love to hate him and you don't really want to fancy him in a race because he mightn't start and he might do something stupid in a race and he might be lethargic like he was in the Ryanair last year. But on pure ability, he has to have a chance. Um, don't really like any of the rest of them. I think either Brave, Brave Man's Game or Shishkin is going to win it. I think Brave Man's Game is the one you know what he's going to do, you know he's going to jump, you know he's going to travel, and if one of the others doesn't produce a moment of magic, I think he'll probably win it. But I've just got this feeling that Shishkin might produce a moment of magic. For me, I have it between Brave Man's Game and Shishkin. Brave Man's Game is a solid one, but I'll probably be back Shishkin. Yeah, like Shishkin is fascinating. Wouldn't it be magic for him to go and win this race? And everyone wants to know what Nicky has to say about Shishkin, so let's find out. He's been good. He, I would have liked to have had a run. But again, it just wasn't possible. He went to Newcastle. I would have run him in the, in, in the rear range fighting fifth. I mean, it all really goes back to the fact that he failed to start at Ascot. And that really knocked the whole plan sideways. So we are coming into the King George without a prep race, which is a brave, if not stupid, thing to do. But then, if he doesn't run in this, where does he go? I mean, you're waiting for the the Cotswold chase possibly at the end of January he's got to run before that so we have got to go here whether you know it, even if this is a practice I hope it's not I, I think he I think he is very very well and I'm sort of hopeful and you put the cheap pieces on an Ascot we know what happened there are you going to leave the headgear the cheap off this pieces time? had nothing no. to do with Ascot but I see you didn't declare him in them in the rehearsal well, chase, went, that's my... yeah let's see no decision has been made Right, OK. Um, it looks a good race. It might not be a, the biggest of fields, but you've got the likes of Alaho, Jerry Colon, Brave Man's Game, um, Royal Pugai. It looks a, a top-notch renewal, doesn't it? Oh, it is. They're very, very good horses. And but so is he. Yeah. You know, um, i say my worry would be the fact that, you know, you are doing this without a, uh, without a run. Um, you know, it, it's never an easy race. Around Kempton, they go flat out all the way. Um, you never get a breather in. It, it, that's the sort of the idiosyncrasy of Kempton, if you like, compared to a lot of other race courses where there's always some way you can just have a little relax for a moment. And I think you usually find in the King George that doesn't happen. There we go, Nicky Henderson saying that it's not ideal that the horse hasn't had a run prior to the race, but you just never know what you're going to get with Shishkin come the day look it's not a race that's easy to go into without a run but like we say look shishkin has all the ability and you just never know might be a selection for dj on the day tom park i don't want to say it but i feel like this could be this could end up going to an outside and it could be a shock i actually quite like frodon in the field and i might be crazy saying this but this horse here like, i knew dj would react like this but like i've had so many winning selections where <laughs> dj's given me this reaction so it's not the worst thing in the world but at least you're humble about it anyway frodon, frodon. <laughs> <laughs> oh well we did see peter Wright in the darts i know he was your selection for that as well dj but he went crashing out last night but yeah look oh. Frodon. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, well look look Fro frodon i just think this horse he's gonna go out in front he's got a good record in this race i mean he's won the race before he then finished fourth when going off a silly pace against Manella Rindo and then finished third last year he just didn't quite hang on and was passed by Lon Press and, and obviously Brave Man's Game I just think that performance that 12 stone carrying performance in the um, Badger Beers I know he's beaten by 17 lengths the form of that race has actually worked out to be quite nice um, with Ford Plan who was sick came out and won at Doncaster and I just think this flat track throwed on us I think he's going to run a mighty race and Ed said there was some each way support for this horse earlier in the week and I can see why Tom Park's even laughing I'd even give a chance to Hewick actually um, I just think the ones at the top of the market there are so many question marks Parky and I'd just rather go with something that I think could end up being solid out in front and just jump them silly it, he ran really well in the Budger Beers and got beat 17 lengths. Yes, I, mean, I know he did. I know he did off 12 stone. I know he's beaten 17 lengths. The form three under three five, I know was 17, uh, well, like 14 lengths ahead, but has since come out and run a really nice race. And Ford Plan ran really well, won really well at Doncaster at the weekend. I just have a feeling thrown on from the front end, he's going to be there or thereabouts at the finish. Look, it's, um, it's an intriguing race um, for many reasons, but Frodon won't be winning it. That, that's one thing that I can be sure about. Um, that's a clip. I have, oh, I'm waiting for the clip, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I have um, 
I have big reservations about Alaho, um, and I think he's absolutely there to be taken on. Um, didn't like his comeback run one bit, to be honest. I thought he, he lacked his kind of usual zip. Um, he doesn't have a very good record at this time of year. Like, he won the John Durkin a couple of years ago, um, and I think that was the first time in four or five attempts that he won in December. Um, he won again last year, but that was a nothing race. Um, I think he went off about three or four one when he actually won the John Durkin that year. So he, it, there was always been a few question marks over him at this time of year. He always had that spectacular season where he was untouchable before um, he got injured. And um, But I wasn't overly convinced about his comeback run. Um, I suspect they're still working back from the Ryanair. And whether he is going to be absolutely the Alaho that we've seen at Cheltenham here, um, I think you're taking a big chance. And at his price, I think there's just no need to because I just think you can absolutely leave him alone if you wanted to. But, but Tom, um, Tom if, if they thought that, would, why would they come over to the UK? I, why would they not stay in Ireland? Because I think that, look, Alaho is, um, I think this is the race that they kind of have always thought that it really would suit Alaho. I think it would. But a horse has had a year out. Um, I just there wasn't enough zip in his comeback run. I just I, I was really unimpressed by it. I thought that before that race, I thought, look, you're gonna if you backed right, um, Alaho for the Ryanair before that at six to one, um, there was he got well back before that race. I thought oh, that he might be sitting on a good bet if he was if he just goes and wins. But like I'm glad I hadn't backed him because I, I don't fancy him for any race, particularly the Ryanair, cause, which I think will be a lot stronger this year. But this is a good race. Um, and I think that there are question marks, certainly about Alaho. There are question marks about a lot of them. Whether Jerry Colomb runs, probably unlikely now. Um, don't really like the, I think the real whacker, like he's got to, you can't be backing him off that run at Cheltenham last time, personally, anyway. And I, I wasn't taken by that at all. Um, Brave Man's game, I agree with DJ. He's, he's going to jump himself into the race. He's going to travel really strongly. I, I just, he's not been showing enough in the finish. And I know that he's done that in the past. Um, I just think he really went through the mill at the Gold Cup. He properly tried. Um, and I just think that sometimes when horses go into that 90% kind of effort, um, some of them don't like it. I think it has left a mark. Um, I'm happy to take a chance. You're obviously going to have to take a chance on Shishkin, but I... I just think Shishkin, I don't think there's any reason why he won't jump off this time. Like, you've just got to take it that that was a one-off. Um, he hasn't really tried to refuse to start before. He does sulk in his races. Um, he even nearly threw away the race at Aintree when he won so spectacularly in the end, but he looked like he was going to pull himself up at one point. Um, Cheltenham was a bit of a disaster, but the ability he showed to kind of, like he was powering home on like a train, finished second in a race like that against a good horse in Ember Island. Um, but the big thing with Shishkin is I'm convinced that they've been running him over the wrong trip for his entire career. Um, and we saw Aintree, Ahoy Senor, that was the real Ahoy Senor that turned up that day. And he absolutely bolted past him once he hit top gear. If Shishkin sets off um, and he jumps the first couple of fences, I, I put him up in the weekend of the other day each way at seven to one and it's a little bit risky probably backing him anti post. What I would advise is if you if you're an in play punter, if he jumps off, fine. And if he jumps the first couple of fences, fine, which is usually the telltale sign with Shishkin whether he's actually at the races. Um if he jumps then fine. If he's there two out, nothing will get nothing will stop him winning because he's gonna just kick that turbo mode that we've seen so often in the past. And he's a proper stayer. Like, I have no qualms whatsoever about the trip. The King George, although Kempton's a sharp three miles, it usually turns into a bit of a war of attrition. I think with Alahorn and the real Wacker going hard up front, it probably will. I just think Shishkin will prove to be the best stayer out of these. I know we've only seen him once over three miles, but he was doing everything right at the end of that race. Um, I just think he is the best horse in the race. And Alahorn, a couple of years ago, I just, I can't have him. Like, Shishkin, mm -hmm. it's obviously not ideal preparation. I get that. And, like, there'll be people going, how can you have, like, qualms about all the, the, the others and not Shishkin? Because he's probably got the most questions to answer. But he's a price. And I think he's the best horse in the race.
Okay, so Parky taking a chance on Shishkin. Seems like DJ's taking a chance on Shishkin. I'm going to be taking a chance on Frodon, no matter what anyone says. Uh, Ed Nixon, just quickly, who do you like? Uh, well, I'm going to go for um, I'm going to go for Allo. Everyone's been negative on the on the on the podcast, but I, I just think he's the best horse, and there are doubts about others. But uh, one thing I would say is that we're all, including me, dissing Brave Man's Game, who's the uh, the current champion. And we, I mean, Paul Nichols, how many times does he does he does he turn it around? I mean, he's won this race 13 times. He's won it more than any other trainer, and he's won it three times with horses back to back. Um, so he knows how to train a horse for it. And although, you know, it is a staying distance of three miles and, you know, he, he, did, he didn't quite get home over the Gold Cup trip, maybe, or he, he didn't, you know, there, there were question marks about that. This this race, although it is three miles, you do get two and a half. You've even got Edgerton Blur winning this race, you know, back in the day. So it's more of a speed stay, if there's such a word, than a stay slog. And, you know, I think that's why I, I like Alaho. That's why I think Brave Man's Game won it last year. Um, and I'm just going to go with Alaho, but I, 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 there's been no support for Braves Man Game, and that's kind of that's 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 where I'm coming from. Make no support at all, um, where you normally get support with Paul Nichols horses, especially when they're being laid out for the big races. Um, so Alaho, I'm going to go against the, the experts here and, and give Alaho a, a, a thumbs up. Okay, yeah, Alaho, Fred Nixon, yeah, call them experts, honestly, me picking out a 40 to 1 shot with Frodon, not the expert on the panel for sure. Let's move on to the 27th then, we've got the big staying handicap chase, which is the Welsh Grand National handicap chase from Chepstow, three mile, six and a half furlongs here, uh, it comes at 250 on the 27th, where Super Survivor is currently 9 to 2 favourite, Autonomous Cloud is 6 to 1, I will do it, 7 to 1, Nasalam also 7 to 1, Complete Unknown is 8 to 1, the Galloping Pair and Iron Bridge 10 to 1 and 11 to 1 and bigger about the rest of the field. We won't know how many places Uni are going to be paying on this race, Ed, on the day, but I imagine there will be extra places for funds to look out for. Yeah, go to unibet.co.uk or on at, at Unibet Racing on the Twitter where we put all our extra place races. There will be extra places on this race. Um, it's a cracking race, isn't it? It's one of my favourite races of the year. I'm going to go back again to some horses of last year or previous years, David. Carville's Hill, do you remember him? We were probably much too young, but you remember him jumping the last, bunny hopping, winning by about 30 lengths in the distance in the Welsh National many years ago. Um, it's a race that uh, I really, really love. Um, obviously, Chepstow's, of course, I know very well. Um, and it's always bottomless, so it would be interesting to see if that changes on the 27th. Um, and it's a competitive race, as always. Um, Super Survivor has been back with us. He's currently a 9-2. to two. In the last 24 hours, he's been back from sixes. And Autonomous Cloud is another one that's been back from eights into sixes. Uh, but I'm going to go for a horse who pulled up last time and finished in between those two at Utoxeter and gets a, there's a weight uh, difference um, and he's 20 to 1. And it's Iron Bridge from John Joe O'Neill's stable. Um, I know this horse very well. He was declared to run at uh, Chepstow and was pulled out because the ground wasn't soft enough. And believe me, it was quite soft that day. Uh, and I spoke to John Joe O'Neill recently about him, and he, he, he was lame um, when he ran at uh, Newbury. Um, so I'm surprised to see him running here, to be honest. But obviously, John Joe O'Neill knows his horses like no one else. And if he says he's good enough to run here, then he's, he's, he's fit enough to run here. And also 20 to 1, his form links in with Super Survivor and Autonomous Cloud. He's only run over, the, di the most distance he's run over is one mile, I think three mile one. Um, he's run a lot over two and a half uh, and three, but he's a, he's a four miler. Um, and he's a horse that I remember speaking to the O'Neills and they said he'll never, ever race where there isn't a, a soft in the going description. A heavy will suit him. Um, Chepso will suit him. The distance will suit him. Um, I'm just hoping that that was a one off that uh, that poor performance at, at Newbury. We know that he, he, he you know, he, he finished. I don't know if he was lame, but he, he wasn't. He wasn't the horse that you can put a form into that into that line. Um, so at 20 to one. Um, I think Iron Bridge would be the selection. I was there at Chepstow when the Asylum won the the, um, the trial for this race. Before that race, he was 50 to 1. After winning it, he was 16, and now he's 10. Um, Gary Moore's horses were winning all the race. That day, he had four winners, if I remember rightly. Um, so his horses are in great form. Um, still in good form, uh, but this horse has not really got... F I don't know whether he'll stay the extreme distance. He's, he's been running over two, two and a half, three. He pulled up, you know, eased up close that day because he was so much in hand so it's difficult to say that he wouldn't stay but to, you know to, to me there's a slight doubt whereas with 
Iron Bridge, I think he'll stay all day. So, so for me, Iron Bridge at a big price, twenty to one, hoping that that run at Newbury, um, with, there'll be a, a, there is a reason for it, and you know he, he came back a little bit, a little bit unsound, and hopefully he'll be he'll be okay. Yeah, next one, Iron Bridge at twenty to one. Tom Park, a couple of minutes to run for your Welsh national sex selection. It's interesting you mentioned Iron Bridge actually because he's in my um, other fancies because he is in at Weatherby in the Royal Merrick on Boxing Day, and he would have be of interest to me in that. Um, I, I, it makes sense what what Ed's saying to be honest. Um, so I'm not sure what what the plan is with him. Um, the the one that I like in this is complete unknown. Um, I mentioned earlier about forgiving some of the runs in the um, Coral Gold Cup last time. Um, the ground just was far too quick for complete unknown unknown in that race. Um, he just wasn't really going um, going a yard at any point. It just all seemed to be happening too quick. If you go back to Newton Abbott. Beating my eye, um, I know DJ is a big fan of my eye. Um, Newton Abbott on heavy ground, um, he's doing all of his best work there. He's a pound out the handicap here because he was dropped a pound for the the Newbury run. That wouldn't bother me. Um, I think he's a really really classy horse. Um, I think he's well handicapped off 152. Um, soft ground is going to be the making of him, um, and the step up to this trip I think is just going to bring out more and more. Um, so yeah, he's the one that I'm going to side with. If I'm Bridge to run, I'd probably have to have a saver on, on that basis. But um, yeah, I was hoping that he would go at Weatherby, but um, he might. It, it, I certainly think it'll be softer here than it will be at Weatherby. Okay, complete unknown for Tom Park and David Jennings. I just want to apologise for bringing up the Peter Wright situation because <laughs> you know me and you are good friends, and I felt really harsh then doing that. But um, I wish you all the best for your Welsh Grand National selection, whoever that may be. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it turns out a bit better than Peter Wright. Um, I uh, I agree with Tom. Complete unknown is um, ground. It was just completely ground in the Coral Gold Cup. Um, I I just don't know how really well handicapped he is. Maybe he'll prove me wrong here, but I, he definitely is a big player. I think he's the classiest horse in the race. And um, if they're all running off level weights, I think he'd win. Uh, so complete unknown is definitely dangerous. Look, I thought the Galloping Bear was going to win this race last year. I really fancied him. was on a double-figure price. He went off 11-2. to two. Look, he was beaten when he came down at the fourth last. But I just don't think the race really suits him. He never got into a rhythm like he did in the Eider next time. And I think if he does get into the rhythm he got into in the Eider, I think he's he's going to be a big player here. Like, that was on ground. That was too quick for him as well in the Eider. Kitty's light beat him, but we know how well handicapped Kitty's light was. He was still seven lengths clear of no cruise jet in third that day. Um, this is just the ideal race for Galloping Bear. He's had a wind operation, and I think if you can forgive him his run in the race last year, I think he's a big, big player. Um, a lot will happen on the first circuit. If he can get into a rhythm, keep himself into contention on, on the first circuit, I think he's, he's got a big chance. Open race, but my two against the field will be complete unknown in the Galloping Bear. Okay, plenty of sport for complete unknown there, along with the galloping bear for David Jennings. Now, don't want the show to overrun too much, but I want to get other Christmas selections from you all. So I want two and a half minutes each to give me all your best Christmas selections. Tom Park, I'll start with you. Who else is there for you to look forward to over Christmas? Um, like, just one, uh, one on Saturday to kick us off. Um, in the 150 uh, Ascot, um, I just thought Sham Blue was quite interesting. He's obviously been pulled up on his last few starts, never really got back to, or well, not got back anywhere near the form of when he looked like he was going to absolutely hose up in the Charlie Hall a couple of years ago. But what's interesting, they've got cheap piece on first time this time. Um, he was left in the King George until like the latest stage. Um, he wasn't confirmed, but he was left in there. Just made me think that they are, it just gives me a little bit of confidence that they might have this horse back to something like he used to be and if he is then he's going to be really he, he's really well handicapped at 142 um just thought he was if you're gonna you're gonna he's probably gonna come good at some point and um he just interests me um he's around six to one i think for the race so it, i'll kick off with sham blue in the 150 ascot on saturday then we'll move on to um kempton on boxing we just got to give a shout out to the the court or star novices because mm. this is an absolute belting race. Um, I can't wait to see what the French horse Ilia Francais um, brings to the table because from the sounds of things, he's really, really exciting. Whether it's a race that I'll have a bet in, um, 
probably not, but I really want to see what this horse is all about. Um, and it's it's an absolute belt of Hermes mm-hmm. Allen, Giovin Cook, classical dream turns. So he's going to love Kempton's perfect for him. Um, and he jumped like a stag on his first um, chase out in. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I just can't wait to get stuck in, really. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the, that's the race, really, that I'm really looking forward to. Um, the Cottle Star, I think that's going to be a belter. Um, yeah. It's turned out to be one of the best races over Christmas, actually. Really looking forward to that quarter star. Another chase, David Jennings. Um, I know, like we say, plenty of action over in Ireland. Two and a half minutes. Bang us through some of the better bets. OK, we'll kick off at Aintree in the rerouted Talworth, which is now the Formby Novice Hurdle. How is Teller the name 6-1? to one? What is going on there? I thought I I thought Teller the name should be favourite. And... Uh, I think Teller the name will win. Um, I think I think he's really good. I know he's beaten by Django by at Ascot um, on his first start for uh, Ben Pauling, but he bolted up at Huntington next time. Beat Lucky Place and Lucky Place absolutely bolted up the last day and is now rated 130. And Teller the name is only rated 132. So I think Teller the name will win that Grade One. Um, in, that's at Aintree. Sorry, I'll give you time. Hold on. The time of that Grade One is uh, 105 at uh, Aintree on the 26th. Staying with the 26th, uh, one of my horses to follow for the season. It's going to, my my uh, twenty my 26th is going to start off uh, either really well or really badly because one of my strongest fancies of the entire Christmas runs in the first race at Kempton, the 12.45. Look, this, this is perfect though. Has to be absolutely chucked in off 123. Just have a look at the way he jumped against Ginny's De- Destiny um, at Cheltenham at the November meeting. I really fancied him there. He's going to make a smash and chase. Or I think a flat track two and a half miles is exactly what he wants. Like he's opened up, like he's opened up ten to one. Holy God! I hope that lasts. If he's ten to one on the day, uh, I would absolutely fall over on the ground in the heat because I'd say he'll likely go off nearly favourite as perfecto. But he's ten to one in a couple of places at the moment. But yeah, I'd be very keen on as perfecto in the twelve forty five at Kempton. Uh, I'm going to give you. Um, I think in the pocket will beat. Uh, Fasal Vega, I know my up in the ante colleague Johnny Deneen is really keen on that and so am I. I think he'll beat uh, Fasal Vega in the Racing Post Novice Chase to feature race at Leperstown on the 26th. And on the 27th, the big handicap, the Paddy Power Chase, uh, my kind of big uh, double-digit fancy over Christmas is Am I Right for Henry de Bromhead and potentially Rachel Blackmore in that 3 o'clock at, at Leperstown on the 27th. Look, I just thought he was too keen, too fizzy, too fresh. On, in that handicap chase at the showcase meeting at Cheltenham. He was beaten into fourth by Quacker Clan, but he's run off the mark of 138 now. I think he's a, a better horse than that. Uh, 14 to 1 is a big price. So am I right in the 3 o'clock at Leperstown on Wednesday? There we go. A few from DJ and Ed Nicholson. Give us a couple. Just two. Um, I'm looking forward to being at Aintree on Boxing Day, where the, uh, the third Unibet Middle Distance Veterans Chase Series takes part. There's been some really good um, good observations about that. So very pleased about that. And uh, there's a good card there, as, as DJ has said. Um, and then Chep's, though, on the 27th, um, looking forward to seeing Burdett Road run in the, in the finale hurdle. Grade two now, which seems a bit, I mean, it used to be grade one, but they've downgraded it, which I don't really understand. So uh, grade, uh, grade two for Burdett Road. But um, that'd be interesting to see how he gets on before being aimed at uh, the Triumph hurdle. And then the only other bet, I'm going to look at is a three runner race at Ascot and I'm going to go for the outsider of three which statistically doesn't work out everyone thinks it does but it doesn't um, I'm going to go for Excello Nicky Henderson's horse in a in a, in a chase um, it's a graduation chase I think over two miles five furlong he's taken on Solo and Straw Fan Jack who are four to six and two to one respectively Excello's a five to one outsider Nick Henderson has got such a good record when he sends horses to have their first British chase at Ascot That's, this century, he's taken 30 horses to Ascot to either be a novice or, like France, come and run in England for the first time, like uh, Val Tor and Janika. And um, 16 of one, 70 percent of one or placed. So he doesn't go to Ascot with a first time chaser. That's either a novice or a horse that's been running in France and like this horse, Excello, been winning over fences um, to Ascot unless they, he thinks he's got the, a fantastic chance. A four-year-old getting all the allowances, uh, 11 stone two, so getting weight from both Solo and Straw Fan Jack, who's still rated higher, uh, it must be said. But I just thought five to one, ran really well on the course over hurdles uh, not long ago. Um, so just a bit of a value, five to one outsider of three. 
Okay, yeah, so that's in the 115 at Ascot on Saturday. Um, there we go. So there are selections for the Christmas period. I've taken note of just just of on that, Sam. Uh, when, when Ed was talking there, uh, I said, Excello, that name rings a bell. Why do I know that name? Excello, and I was racking my brain. I was like, I know how I know that name. Back in the heat of summer, I was in the car park in Royal Ascot doing a colour piece for, for the Racing Post, and I was asked to go around and mingle with the with the with the well heels and uh, i bumped into anthony bromley and i said to him i said uh, we're having a drink and i said right give me one horse to follow for the season one horse you've bought to follow for the season and i'm just after finding the piece here and he said excello he's been chasing in france but he's not won a hurdle race he's a four-year-old and he goes straight into good novice hurdles on saturdays he's gone to nicky's and we like him so and I next line of the piece is the name is Excello by the way write it down put the page somewhere safe and remember where you put it it could pay de- <laughs> dividends next November so uh, I said next November so maybe December so that's interesting Excello who has already obviously been beaten but uh, I was trying to remember how I remember the names so there you go Ed <laughs> there we go it some com- <laughs> there's some confidence behind the outsider of three in the one fifteen at Ascot on Saturday. Right, we need to get the naps. These are going to be the naps for Saturday. Unibet are going to boost these from 9am of the day of the race. Ed, is that right? We're at, no, we're actually going to do it from the moment this podcast comes out. So we, well, we looked we at it last week and we thought it's only fair. You're talking about your naps when it comes out at 7. So you can get the boost price up from 7. Even better. So that's changed from last week. You can now get the yep. naps at the boosted price as soon as this show goes out. Uh Tom Park, you can start us off with your weekend nap. Might be Excel after hearing all that. <laughs> um, yeah, my nap's um, Alto Belly in the 335 Ascot on Saturday. Um, yeah, very keen on his chances. Um, tough race, but this is gonna this is the likely winner and um, it's been laid out for it. Um, and you, because it's a tough race, you get in the price. So I think Alto Belly's got an excellent chance. So Alto Belly for me. Yeah, Altabelli for Tom. I was speaking to him earlier today. I was going to nap up Altabelli, so I had to switch to my next best, who will be Botox Has in the Long Walk Hurdle, who I thought was a really impressive winner uh, towards the start of the season on the 4th of November at Weatherby, beating the likes of Red Risk, Dasher Drasher, and, and obviously Time Hill that day. And Kaylin Quinn gets along with this horse really well. You see Nar Hula has been put on Goshen, but it's due to the fact that Kaylin Quinn Gets along this horse so well. Last time he won on this horse prior to Weatherby was actually in that stayers handicap hurdle at Haydock back in November of 2022. I think this horse would really appreciate the flat track there. I think he's actually the improving horse. And like we said, the old timers and the two handicappers at the top of the market, I think they're worth taking on. Um, and I've got a feeling, I mean, Gary, this was a Gary Moore horse that won when Gary Moore was completely out of form. He's now absolutely banging in winners left, right and centre and, and obviously landed that big gamble on Wednesday at Lingfield. I think his horse is just in flying form. I think Botox has is actually quite a nice price at around sort of the nine to one mark for the long walk on Saturday. David Jennings, your nap, please. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regret this. Um, I know we were talking before the show and I, I was going to go for Hasker Claremont, which I'd written down in my notes before the show. That's my nap, Hasker Claremont in the three o'clock. But just as we were talking uh, about the, the handicap hurdle at Haydock, I, I, I just, I, I really am very, very sweet on Gubernator, which is in, I'll get you the time now, it's in the 205, 205 at uh, 205 at Haydock, uh, Gubernator. Just think he's turned into a really well handicapped horse who we haven't seen the best of over hurdles yet. And I thought 15 to 2 was a big price. Any enhancements on that would be magic. But uh, Gubernator for Theo Gillard and Donald McCain in the 205 at Haydock, please. Okay, Gubernator for David Jennings and Ed Nicholson, your nap for Saturday. Tommy Whittle, 130 Haydock, Bill Baxter, rated 140, 1 over 133, the top and fences. Haydock's fence is very similar. Flat track will suit him. Got the excellent James Bowen on board. Ran really well in the uh, Coral Gold Cup. So uh, I'm hoping that Bill Baxter comes back to the winner's enclosure this time around. There we go. There are your winners. That could be quite a popular lucky 15 as well with myself for this weekend. Uh, so we've got Christmas Day coming up. We're only a few days away now. Just quickly, what are people up to? David Jennings, obviously with the family on Christmas Day. Looking forward to that. I bet the kids are excited. Yeah, I'm a big softy. I love Christmas. Yeah. Uh, I uh, Yeah, Christmas. Like I know the racing is great, but uh, and everybody says, oh, my Christmas starts on the 26th, but it doesn't. <laughs> Christmas morning. 
when you're coming down them stairs, you still get that unbelievable feeling that you only get once a year, and it's just magical. So, uh, yeah, can't wait for, for Christmas, and love Christmas Eve as well. We're having people over to the house, so... Um, yeah, I'm just I'm one of those big softies that everybody hates because I love Christmas. <laughs> oh, I, I love it as well. So don't worry about that. I'll be up at probably seven a.m. in the morning making myself a breakfast. Ed Nicholson, what are your plans? Uh, Christmas, like everybody else, then um, off to Aintree for Boxing Day. Obviously, the new fixture there. I've been I've been to other Boxing Day fixtures um, all over the place, but uh, be interesting to see how how that area deals with the Boxing Day fixture. I'm really looking forward to seeing how busy it is for a start. Um, and there's some good races there as well. There is absolutely some good racing at Aintree on Boxing Day, as there is everywhere on Boxing Day. Tom Park, what are your plans? Um, it's the first... Like, we've just I moved back home this year, so it's the first time in about 12 years that I'm actually spending um, Christmas morning at home and not at my parents, but we'll be... Um, yeah, I'm trying... I've got the running bug at the moment and there's a park run on Christmas morning and my wife is absolutely fuming that I'm considering it. I'm uh, fuming that you're considering here, it. Uh, I'm, I'm any, fuming about it. Any, any, any chance you could give me some saliva or something so I collect that bug, no? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to get the running bug. That's what I'd I love know. to get. Well, I used to think, I could never understand what on earth do people like in running? Like, it's just painful. And But yeah, I've got it. And um, So I, I am... I would like to do the park run, whether it whether it, that gets through the door. I don't think it probably I'll will. I'll see so, you there. I'll um, see you on the start. Might be a quiet Christmas morning. Um, and then, yeah, I'll be going around the parents for Christmas dinner and, and not so quiet Christmas night. It's the first first Christmas my brother's with my brother's little one. So um, they had a little one. He's a few months old. So it's good. that'll be good fun. But, um, yeah, it might revolve around the park run, believe it or not. I never thought I'd be saying that at any point at the start of 2023. But, yeah. Here we are. There we go. That's an interesting one. I never expected to hear that, to be totally honest. <laughs> I'm going to be at home with the family. Um, looking forward to that. I'm in London for the next four days working on a few bits. And then I'll be back home with the family. And I will be at Fontwell Park on Boxing Day, where I traditionally spend the day with my dad. Um, looking forward to that. I'm sure Gary Moore will definitely have winners at Fontwell Park on, on Boxing Day. That's almost a certainty. And hopefully he can have a few winners as well. Um, which will make the Christmas as well as Frodo winning the King George. But we've less said about that, the better. Uh, we're going to be back again, not on Thursday next week. We're going to be back on Friday because we're going to have the declarations there for New Year's Day at Cheltenham. Really looking forward to that preview because that's always a cracking card and some good entries already for some of the big races there. Merry Christmas to the whole panel. Thanks for joining me, Ed Nicholson, David Jennings and Tom Park. Hope everyone, all our viewers, have a great Christmas and we will see you again next Friday for another postcast.